Okay, the third session for today is, Were Jesus and Mary Magdalene Married? And it's an assessment of the evidence for this offered in the Da Vinci Code and, of course, in Dan Brown's sources that he draws from. This, of course, is the central question, who was Mary Magdalene, uh, of the whole debate. Brown and his sources build a lot on understanding Mary as the lower left-hand corner, uh, of course, you know, the bare breasts uh, depicted in art often this way because of the supposition, an incorrect supposition, that Mary Magdalene's you know, sins were somehow related to you know, sexual activity, that she was a harlot, a prostitute, and whatnot. There really isn't any evidence in the New Testament for that, but we're going to talk in the course of this session as to where the idea came from. And I'm going to try to show you how, you know, the, essentially the chain of logic, the chain of thinking that led to a misconception of who Mary was. And then we'll talk about you know, who she really was and the, the claims of the Da Vinci Code. But the Da Vinci Code makes a great deal of casting the church as an evil enemy, an enemy to be looked upon with the hermeneutic of suspicion because they allegedly, supposedly, deliberately cast Mary as a prostitute not because they misunderstood the New Testament, which is what I'm going to show you. That, that, that's really where it comes from. But they would say, no, Mary was taken as a harlot because the, the church deliberately wanted to suppress the idea that Jesus and Mary were married. That it was, it was, this was part of a, of a greater conspiracy to put down Mary in reaction to this truth that they wanted to suppress, that Jesus had a wife. Oh, by the way, I should mention, you notice in some of these that Mary is holding an egg. just thought I'd mention this in passing. If you wonder what that's about, there's a story. Uh, it's not a biblical story, uh, so it's, it's extra biblical, about after the uh, resurrection, Mary uh, had audience with the emperor Tiberius. And she went before Tiberius and essentially was giving him the gospel, telling him about Jesus and the resurrection and so on and so forth. And she, uh, the story isn't clear whether she was going to you know, do something or whether this just was a happenstance. But the emperor said, resurrection, oh, come on, you know, that I see you have an egg in your hand. That egg would, would no sooner you know, turn red right now than the resurrection be true. And, of course, the story is that the egg turns red. And she holds it up and says, you know, you, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so it's, it's an apocryphal story, but kind of an interesting one. But the church picked up on it uh, historically. And so you'll often see Mary with an egg, either the white or the red one, you know, in commemoration of the story. Who she wasn't. How did Mary Magdalene come to be identified as a prostitute? Now, this you're going to have to pay attention to closely. Uh, this is not a shameless plug for the software company I work for. <laughs> but it is nevertheless our software. Uh, if you're interested, go. No, I won't give you the web address. <laughs> this is the passage in uh, Luke chapter 7 where a sinful woman comes to Jesus and does you know, a certain thing and anoints his feet and whatnot. Let's just take a, look, a quick look at the passage. I don't want to read all these passages. I'm going to show you a bunch of them. But if, this is Luke 7. And so one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, took his place at the table. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, so the woman is called a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him, that is Jesus, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus, of course, answers him and basically tells him to back off. You go down to verse 48. Uh, he, says, he says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And everyone around says, wow, you know, who can forgive sins? You know, but God, he even forgives sins. And he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, if you look at this section, this pericope, to use scholar speak, you will notice that the woman is never named. There's no name given. 
It's really not even an indication of what kind of sins she is guilty of. Look at the next chapter, chapter 8. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages. So Jesus is even at a different location. Proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, so on and so forth. In the original New Testament, the way the Greek New Testament was written, there were no paragraph divisions. There were no verse divisions. They didn't even have spaces between the, le- the, the words. It all ran together. And so it is possible, it is possible, again, we're trying to be not conspiratorial here, not, you know, not negative toward you know, the, some early church interpreters. It is possible that they just assumed that the woman in the narrative that preceded the narrative of chapter 8 were one and the same. That's one way that this could have happened. If you'll notice, though, there's no way that this is the case. What I'm going to show you here, again, it's going to be a little hard to follow until we get to a certain point, and I hope it'll come together for you. This is, in our software, a, a harmony or a synopsis, excuse me. On the left-hand column, just think that's where Matthew should be. There's a blank there now. Middle, okay, is Luke. And on the other side, we're going to have Mark. You'll notice here, this is Luke 7. We have the story of Jesus anointing by the sinful woman. Off here to your right, there's a little comment. There is a similar episode recorded in Mark 14 and Matthew 26, but it's a separate occasion. Here is Mark 14, Matthew 26. Luke in the middle. And you'll notice that the three of them are narrating the same event, but the details aren't always the same. So it starts out two days after, or after two days was the feast of the Passover. Luke, feast of the unleavened bread, which is called Passover. Matthew 26, you know, we get after this, and you know, it goes down where they're gathered again. In verse 2, it mentions the Passover. So we're locked in at this Passover event with all three. As you go on, again, these are consecutive verses. Let me go back. We have Mark 14, 1 to 2. Here's 3 to 9. So this is is running gospel narrative. You go back, and Luke has two verses for this event, but then he breaks off the story. There's nothing here. Here's the story of Jesus' anointing by a woman. But they're not the same story. We'll get to that in a second. Here Luke resumes, verse 3. Here's 10th verse of Mark, Matthew 26. And Luke resumes his account. Here's what you get if you look at them all together. You've got running narrative, running narrative. Luke starts up here at the same place as Matthew and Mark. Then there's this gap. And then they resume at the same place. This again, going back to the last thing about the synoptic problem, this is where there's disagreements between the Gospels. They won't include all the same stories or they'll disagree on details as well. Now my point here is to say that the account in Luke 7, the sinful woman anointing Jesus you know, with the, alaba- the ointment in the alabaster jar and weeping and wiping his feet with tears, that is a different story than the story in Matthew and Mark. How do we know that? How do we know there are different accounts? It's, the one in Luke is chronologically displaced. If you look here, this is the flow of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus begins his ministry in chapter 4, and here's your subject matter. Right here is where the sinful woman anoints Jesus. Down here is the passion and the resurrection narratives. This is where Matthew and Mark's stories are. But you can see Luke's story, again, is in the middle here. Just to illustrate, you have this gap. There's chronological displacement, so we know that they're not the same story. They also disagree in significant details. Here's Mark. Here's Matthew. The blue underlining is underlining similar elements. In some cases, pretty much identical. Here's Luke. The stuff in the red are the different details. 
it's not the same story. Now, what I'm angling here toward, or toward here, and I'm going to get here in a few minutes, is I said before, one explanation of how Mary could have been understood as a prostitute was they just assumed that the woman in chapter 8, who is named Mary Magdalene, is the sinner in, in Luke chapter 7. It never says that. The New Testament never makes the connection. The other way they could have done this is what I'm going to show you here. By assuming that the sinful woman of Luke 7 is the same woman in these over here. The narratives never actually say that, and as we've seen, there's a chronological gap. The problem is, is that the woman in this story and this story is identified in John, the fourth gospel, as a Mary. Here's the, the passage. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. You read on, they're at dinner there with Lazarus and Martha. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, the early church, many interpreters, read this from John 12 and assumed that this named the, the woman in Matthew and Mark, and then they assumed that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were telling the same story. And that is how Mary became, Mary Magdalene became an evil, sinful woman. The problem is, is that they're just, they're, they're still two different accounts. This, is, this has been the, the, the view since the Middle Ages. Why do I go into the detail? Because I want you to know that there is another reason why Mary could have been wrongly assumed to be a sinful woman other than the evil, conspiracy-minded early church, those nasty guys we call the church fathers who were just doing all they could to suppress the truth of the Gnostic Christian you know, movement. It's conspiratorial logic which doesn't hold up. I'm actually going to devote a whole section to the logic behind you know, the, this view. It's very easy. I mean, could you just, just go back? If I had not showed you in red and blue, if I would have just said, sit down and read these real quickly, or, yeah, you've read these before, you could come away thinking that they're the same. And especially when you read this in John 12, where Mary, some Mary, is named right here, because there's the feet, the wiping <clears> the feet, and the ointment. You could assume they're the same thing, and that's what a lot of people in the early church did, and they were wrong. Since there are clear differences in the accounts, scholars recognize them as two separate events. Again, what I'm going to give you here is nothing new to me. This is just the standard view among basically all New Testament scholars. They proposed... Two solutions for answering why the Gospels have two separate stories so closely alike. Let's talk about the easy solution. <laughs> the easy solution is that the separate stories of Matthew and Mark and Luke got mixed in John. They became mixed during oral tradition by the time John wrote, and he frankly just didn't know that they were separate stories. John goofed. He wrote the last Gospel. He didn't know they were separate stories, and he mixed them up. That's the easy view. Problem with that, are, though, first, John would have been an eyewitness to these things, so you'd think he would kind of remember what happened, at least, you know, in some sense, enough to not mix them. Or two, John's gospel was the last one written, so the other stories were already around. He could have just looked. Why Wendy? He should have known. So it's not terribly coherent, but that is the easy solution. The harder but better solution is this. Matthew, Mark, and John do report the same event, and Luke's is different. Luke's is a different one. John adds the feet element in his report for a specific reason. This view is based on the observation that there are still irreconcilable differences between Luke's and John's versions requiring them to be separate events. Of course, we have the chronology problem that I pointed out a few minutes ago. Luke's chronology follows Matthew Mark, but it's an anointing event way before the other ones. And the sinful characterization of the woman in Luke 7. Now look at John and Luke 7. This is the one that names Mary 
And I'm saying this one is the one that Matthew and Mark are talking about, and Luke is different. There are significant differences between Luke. Look at all the yellow and the one in John. Critical story details that are different. And though it's harder for us to understand, unless you're, you, you do this sort of thing, you, know, you study the Gospels a lot, this is the more coherent view, that Luke is just different. It's a different event. Now, comments. The harder view means that the anointing of the head and feet are both for burial. This is easily explained in that the anointing of the head was a ritual act for anointing a king. That's how they usually did it in the Old Testament. The feet denoted putting one's enemies under one's feet. That's why you would anoint a king's feet, to signify that he would, it's a very common Old Testament gesture, to put the foot on the neck of your enemy meant to, that you've conquered them. If you go read Joshua, for instance, Joshua specifically commands, um, it's either Joshua or Judges, this is specifically commanded on an occasion or two where to signify victory, he says, go up and you put your foot on the neck of this conquered king to denote to everyone that victory is complete. It, it's, it was a commonly known gesture. Two, how likely is it that there would have been two anointing events in Jesus' life? Well, actually vary because it was a common practice for formal meals, which were held all the time. The harder view also means that there are two separate Simons. We found out later in, find out later in Luke that the Pharisee was named Simon. How likely is that? Very. There are 19 Simons in the work of Josephus. It's a common name. It's like Smith is now, or John, or Dave, or Mike for that matter. Simon was a popular name since it was the name of one of Israel's tribes and a Maccabean hero in the intertestamental period. Jesus' apostolic band had two Simons. Even in the 12, he got two of them, Peter and Simon the Zealot. And there were three Jameses among the 12. You just have common names, so it's, it's not much of a stretch. The harder view means that the gospel accounts don't contradict and that Mary Magdalene is not a prostitute. But there were lots of guys in the early church that just... They were wrong, and the tradition stuck. And Mary Magdalene became known in history as a prostitute, wrongly, because the New Testament never says that. It's unfortunate. So if she wasn't a prostitute, who was she? This is a search result that shows us all the places where Mary Magdalene shows up in the New Testament. This is it. Not, you know, not a, I mean, she's an important character for sure, but not in terms of quantity of reference. You've got, of course, Matthew, Mark references there and some of it we've already seen. She's the first one, of course, you know, to see the resurrected Christ. She's at the crucifixion, very loyal to Jesus when Peter and the apostles are, you know, getting out of Dodge. You know, Mary sticks, you know, sticks by the Lord and goes to the crucifixion site. Luke 8, 1 to 3 says Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. We know that for sure. Matthew 27, 55 tells us that several women, including her, traveled with Jesus and the twelve. According to Mark 15, a group of women watched the crucifixion from afar. The first one mentioned is Mary. Mark 15, again, she gets to see the empty tomb. The story makes apparent that Mary Magdalene, like the other disciples, was not anticipating encountering a risen Jesus. Now, if you stop and think about it, this runs quite contrary to the claim in the Da Vinci Code that there was a conspiracy to get Jesus off the cross early, or this was a plot that they crucified someone else. It's all the basic Passover plot stuff from the 1960s uh, by Hugh Schoenfeld that now Michael Bajent in his book, The Jesus Papers, is basically rehashing for us 40 years later. They were not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. If they were just, if this was some sort of plot, you know, these, these kinds of references are pointless. The disciples are depressed in the Gospels. They're bummed, you know, to put it in our vernacular. This is not a good thing. They are caught by surprise. when they, they, you know, I'll grant you they should have known better because Jesus is walking around half the time saying, the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem and there the chief priests will grab him and they'll beat him and they'll kill him and he'll rise again the third day. And the disciples are like, what? Did, did you hear something? It must have been a fly buzzing by my ear or something. I mean, it's like, why don't these guys get it? Because they're, they're like stunned when it happens. And you know, half, half, you know, Thomas doesn't even believe it after Mary comes back and tells them. 
He's the guy that says, well, until I stick my finger in the palms of his hands, I'm not going to believe it. You know, so much for the conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of ignorance if it was anything. If this is all there is in the New Testament, where does the idea that Mary, Magdalene, and Jesus were married come, come from? Now look, this right here, let's go back real quick. This is it. This is every place in the New Testament that Mary Magdalene is mentioned. So where do we get this idea? Let's traverse forward here. That she was married. Well, let's go to the Coptic Gnostic Library. And again, this is my, my pattern. This is what I like to do. I'm not making it up. What I'm going to show you, I'm not making up. This is the official publication source of all the texts from Nag Hammadi that Michael Bajent has grown to love. Okay? This is them. This is the official publication arm. Coptic Gnostic Library. And this, this is, by the way, a shameless plug for our software. We have them in electronic version. So I can search them at will, <laughs> which is really cool. Now, in the hard copy publication, this is page 169 from this source. This is the Gospel of Philip. This is the passage that the Da Vinci Code characters quote that somehow they get Jesus married from. It says, you know, the prior pages, that Jesus loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her blank. Sounds like match game, you know, with Gene Rayburn. Okay, if you remember the old game show, why is there a blank here in the official publication of the Gnostic Gospels? Can anyone tell me why there's a blank here? Are they part of the greater conspiracy? It's blank there because there's no text there. There's a hole. There's nothing there. It's blank. Now, see the little asterisk here? What Michael Bajent should have done, A, is get the book, look it up in the book, and read the footnote. At the gap for 63, kiss. It says, or greet. It could even be greet. Although kiss may be correct, the Coptic construction found here is not normally used in this sense. Now, I didn't steal the book and put that in. Okay, this is from the official publishing arm of the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Gospels. Look it up. The red underlining. On her blank. Every time I say that, the music from Match Game just goes through my head. <laughs> On her, there was a guy at work that was actually playing that to this. I don't know. I think he wanted me to have this moment that I'm having right now. On her blank, possibly on her mouth, on her feet, or on her cheek, or on her forehead. Now, why are there four options? This is what textual critics, like the guys who just put together the Gospel of Judas, do for a living. What they're doing, here's the Coptic. This is page 168. Uh, this is the flip page to the English I just showed you. Same underlined portion, it's a blank. The footnote down here. What they're doing is they're taking the blank and they're saying, okay, how many letters could fit in the blank in the actual manuscript? And once they have the number, based on, and they'll actually do this. And I know this sounds horrifically boring, and it probably is. But guys who do this for a living, they will measure to the millimeter the size of the letters in a given manuscript because they want to know when they have gaps what will fit. And there are four words that could fit and make sense in context. Orgarete, okay, you've got the reference to, you know, again, the cheek, the forehead. All of these have the same letter spacing. They will accommodate the gap. This is German here, a guy named Schenk. Schenk, I'll read it off, off the screen here. Auf mals auf ihre Mundi. There's a German scholar that suggests often on her mouth. 
and they say, well, we'll note that because this is a scholar guy who we respect, but you know what? There are four other words that would fit in there that all make sense in the ancient world because you kissed, when you greeted someone, you kissed them on the forehead, you kissed them on the cheek. You know, yeah, you can kiss them on the lips too. I mean, people still do that, you know, in European, you know, Eastern cultures and so on and so forth. So the idea that this is a done deal, that this text says with certainty that Jesus is kissing Mary Magdalene on the mouth is just false. Okay? It might. I mean, who knows? We don't know. There's a gap there. In fact, there isn't a single text in all the ancient Gnostic material from Nag Hammadi that has Jesus and Mary Magdalene married. You say, how do you know that, Mike? Here's how I know. We have them in electronic form, and I searched them for you. Here we go. Here's a search for married. This search will find any word close to this spelling. Mary, married, marries. I put in the term, I clicked the search button, and here's what I got. This is the place where this term occurs in the Nag Hammadi collection. All the stuff known in the world now except the Gospel of Judas. And I brought that with me today too. And Jesus isn't married in that one either. So, you know, the editors haven't put it into the database yet. I guess we'll get there someday. You'll notice you don't have any Jesus married here. Let's try wife. How about wife? Well, we get a few here. I put my little hand icon here because this one kind of looks interesting. It has the phrase Mary in gaps. And by the way, when there's brackets, that means that's a blank too. It's a reconstruction. But we'll look it up anyway because we have the word Mary. The editors have put in there and Mary, your wife. Well, I wonder who she's married to. Well, here's the verse. Right here in blue is the hit. Hasten, come with Mary, your wife, all your relatives, blah, 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 blah. This is the second apostle of James. And of course, if you read the few lines that precede, we're not talking about Jesus. How about bride? See, I'm, I'm trying to think of all the terms to search that have something to do with marriage, and I'm searching the entire database of the Gnostic Gospels to ask the question, is there any evidence at all, even in the Gnostic material, for Jesus being married to anybody? And the answer is no. So we search for wife or bride. Excuse me. Here we go. You know, here are the hits in context. Again, if, if you want to look them up, you can buy the print edition, whatever. I mean, here you have, you buy the DVDs, you got all the references there for you. How about husband? Well, we'll search for that one. Guess what? We come up empty there too. You know, what a surprise. So on and so forth. Well, what about the word companion in the Gospel of Philip? The Da Vinci Code makes a big deal out of this too. Pages 245 and 246. Flipping to the middle of the book, you know, the drama's building now. Teaming pointed to a passage. The Gospel of Philip is always a good place to start. You know, when we're talking about Jesus and Mary, Sophie read the passage. And the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. Jesus loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. Of course, we know that's a gap now. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. And they said, why, don't you love, why do you love her more than all of us? The words surprise Sophie. And yet they hardly seem conclusive. It says nothing of marriage, she says. All contraire, Teabing smiled, pointing to the first line. This, this is my favorite quote in the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> you probably know this. <laughs> As any Aramaic scholar will tell you, the word companion in those days literally meant spouse. Landon concurred with a nod. I just, I love that quote because the word for companion in the Gospel of Philip would be in what language? Coptic. And it reflects a Greek original. It's not Aramaic. Like I said, that's my favorite quote in the Da Vinci Code because it's so stupid. As any Aramaic scholar will, it's not even the right language. Get the language right, Dan. I mean, come on. Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> Here's the word. In Coptic, it is koinonos. It's, a, it's actually a, a Greek loan word, so we know exactly what the word is. 
This is the rather thrilling entry. Don't you just love my graphics? It's a bunch of gobbledygook unless you've had Greek. This is the entry from, this is either, I have the second one labeled, I think. Yeah. This one is Bauer, Arndt, Donker, and Gingrich. This is the primary Greek lexicon for New Testament and related literature in the world. It's expensive, but we have it in electronic. Did I, did I mention that before? <laughs> have a little fun with that. This is the entry for Koinonos. If you read through the entire entry, you will notice something, even if you can't read Greek. At no point, at no point, and you'll see the abbreviations. These are biblical books right here, Septuagint, if it's Old Testament, New Testament Greek. At no point does koinonos mean wife. Not just in the New Testament, but in other Greek literature too. It's not the word for wife. Now, I can call my wife my partner, my companion, but I can go into business with someone and call them my companion, my partner. Does that mean I'm having a sexual relationship with them? No. Like, use your head. I mean, when I, when I came to that passage in the Da Vinci Code, it just, it just about killed me. But I moved on. <laughs> Here's the rest of the entry. The entry was too big to fit on one screen. You know, it, koino, a koinonos is a partner. It's one who participates in something you know, with someone else, a companion, a friend. Okay? It's not used for a sexual relationship. This is another Greek lexicon. This is the lexicon known as Lydell Scott. This is the primary Greek lexicon for non-New Testament Greek literature classical literature, intertestamental literature, stuff like Josephus and whatnot. This is the big one. This is a mammoth resource. Um, that These two lexicons are the standard lexicons in the field of Greek studies in the world. Okay? And they're going to tell you where to look up you know, the, the abbreviations. If you do have an electronic, you can just ho hover your mouse over. It tells you where it is, where to go, all that kind of thing. Koinonos the companion argument is a non-argument. It is entirely fabricated. Was Jesus required to have a wife because he was a rabbi? This is another issue that comes up with the Jesus-Mary problem or issue. Jesus wasn't a rabbi in the sense of the Jewish religious office. Proof for this is self-evident in the Gospels. And again, I'm thinking, why doesn't Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln, and Picknett and Prince just quote the New Testament? The Pharisees challenged what Jesus said several times by asking him this question. By what authority do you teach this? Why are you saying this? Look, look at the verse. And he entered the temple. The chief priests and elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? If he was an ordained rabbi, that would be a dumb question. Because they would have had to approve his office. Okay? That would have been like, you know, mass deja vu, or not deja vu, but mass memory loss or something. John 7, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled and said, I love this one, how is it this man is learning since he never studied? He didn't even go to seminary. He's not a rabbi. Okay, you have to have formal training and you have to go through a, a, a procedure to have the rabbinical community approve you in that office. Jesus never did that. Okay. He never had that. He was not a rabbi. He is not required to be married. He is called rabbi in, in passages because the word also just means anybody who teaches. He's a teacher. We have the same thing now, like if, if we use the word instructor. Instructor can be someone who works in a daycare. If you're on a university campus, that's an official title. It usually means you don't have your PhD yet, you're a graduate student. If you, if, if you uh, are, a, are an instructor beyond your PhD, that is a non-tenure track specific designation. But it's the same word. It doesn't mean anything official inherently, it depends on the context. Same thing going on here. Is there anything theologically amiss with the idea that Jesus was married in principle? I would say no. 
It really wouldn't matter if he was, other than the fact that people would be coming up with these weird theories about his kids being like super holy or something or supermen. You know, and I think, I think honestly, that's probably one of the great reasons why he never was, because people would just come up with loony ideas about his kids if he ever had any. So in principle, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, this is from uh, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says, don't we have the right to eat and drink? Don't we have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Cephas is Peter. He says, hey, I could be married if I want to. Paul was single. He, Paul may have been divorced. Uh, he may have been deserted by a spouse, or he may have never been married. We just don't know. Uh, he, he refers to himself as unmarried, and unmarried just means the state of being without a spouse. So we, we don't know why he was unmarried. Uh, who knows? Traditions encouraging dedicated, a dedicated single life also existed elsewhere in Judaism. This one, this one is a kicker for me. Because often Bajent and Lincoln and Lee and all these people want to link Jesus with the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was the place where you had most, you know, 99% of the men refused to be married. Up until a few years ago, it was assumed that no Essene could be married and join the community. Since then, there have been skeletons discovered that are female and a few that are, that are children. So the assumption is that at least one of these people was married. Okay? But if you're going to put Jesus in the Essenes, why are you talking about him married, being married to Mary Magdalene? It's completely contradictory. But again, no, it, it's, it's like they don't care. They don't care about being consistent. They don't care about the primary data. Uh, the Essenes, again, were known for their emphasis on celibacy, and so that is not uncommon to have a teacher, a rabbi, a Jewish leader who wasn't married. There's no evidence that Jesus was. It doesn't really matter, at least in my view. But that is the primary data. Again, to summarize, I'll just say it in one sentence. There isn't a single text, a single line in the New Testament or in the Gnostic material that has Jesus married to anybody much less Mary Magdalene. It's a myth. Okay. Questions? Wouldn't you think that there's a great appeal for the readers to think that Mary Magdalene married Jesus? I think it gives... Um, uh, Define what idea. you mean by appeal. Well, I'm trying to think of some people without saying this in a pejorative sort of way, but I know more than a few women who like the idea that Mary Magdalene achieved a sort of state of blessedness mm -hmm. through her union. She was redeemed and, and uh, it gives some people a lot of um, credibility who otherwise might feel like they're second-rate followers of Jesus. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, on the one hand, I understand how hanging on to that idea would, I don't want this to sound negative, but to convey the impression that that would give them a warm, fuzzy feeling, that that would just make them feel good. I understand that. What I don't understand is the flawed thinking that says, whether consciously or unconsciously, that, that I need that to be true, you know, to, to feel uh, essentially that I'm valued in the eyes of God. In other words, what I'm saying is, is if, if a woman today or even then needed to think that Mary Magdalene was married so that she could feel more worthy or worthy at all in God's eyes, that's really bad theology. And it's, and it's probably not her fault. It's probably the fault of whoever's supposed to be teaching her, probably her own household in those days. But that is really bad theology. Now we're going to see, though, I think it's the next session when we talk about women in Christianity, um, that it was common, just generally speaking, whether... Uh, in Jewish circles, early Christian circles, and surprise, surprise, Gnostic circles, to have a low view of women generally. Now, there's a lot going on in the New Testament, and we're going we're gonna to look at this, in the content of the New Testament that actually elevates women well above the normal social situation, the normal social milieu of the New Testament era. Jesus does things, just one example, he has women followers that travel with him. That was just unheard of. There are things like that that are going on 
that with what Jesus is doing and what the, the New Testament writers are doing brings uh, the, the, the woman's social station up here. Now, it's not the 20th century. It's still a, a patriarchal culture. But to think that the New Testament puts women down at foot level, like the broader culture did, and even the broader culture, not everybody thought that way, but to think that that's what's going on in the New Testament, you're just not reading it. You're just not reading it. You're taking somebody's word for it. And you know, we'll, we'll get into that. that. I realize that in some sense, even in Christian circles, this is controversial because of the can women be ordained question, that, that kind of thing. But the fact that that's a question tells you that there's stuff going on in the New Testament that have women very highly placed. If that wasn't the case, we would not even have that debate. You follow what I'm saying? If women were not found in elevated social situations and ecclesiastical situations in the New Testament and the early church, there would be no reason to have a scriptural debate on whether women can be ordained. It would be dumb. It'd be like debating if, if Jesus was, a, was you, know, you know, some sort of beaver. Was Jesus a beaver or not? Well, let's go to the scriptures and debate that. You know, it's just, it's nonsense. I picked an absurd example because the fact that, that you're debating over, over the New Testament text, over passages, tells you that women, you know, there are some really interesting passages about a woman's position in the early church. And, and it, it caused consternation then, and it causes consternation now. Another question. Yes. Guy. The passage from Philip you had up earlier, that's, uh, you kind of showed there's a hole in the text, whether it's your own mouth or not. But the other statement in that sentence was that, um, why do you favor her so much above us? Yeah. Outside of that sentence or right there, is there anything else in the Gospel of Philip or not, or, or in the Gospel of Philip or the Gnostics? that actually show Jesus did favor her above the other disciples in any way? I would, I would tend to think, my, my own view is, is I tend to think that, that the, Jesus is definitely kissing her, okay, somewhere. Uh, it may have been on the mouth. If, if you put a gun to my head, I'd, I'd probably say it was either the mouth or the forehead or something like that. What you need to parse that passage is to understand what the significance of kissing was to a Gnostic. There are other passages in the Gospel of Philip where when not just Jesus, but Jesus or somebody else, but especially Jesus, but not only him, when he kisses someone, they become pregnant. Now, you either have to believe that in the Gnostic community, nobody knew where babies came from, or you have to believe that kissing and words like pregnant meant something mystical and spiritual to the Gnostics. And it did. What it meant was, again, you have, you have to put yourself in the mindset of this physical, sexual, or, or semi-sexual content because the Gnostics used those terms, those physical bodily terms, to describe what they imagined going on or what went on eons ago with the aeons that there was this coming together of Sophia and the Christos to unite the Pleroma, to make it whole again, to fix it, to make, make all things new, to, to make it the way it, it should be. To a Gnostic, when the earthly Jesus kissed someone, he was imparting to them, he, he was doing that because he viewed that person as spiritually enlightened, and he was transmitting the spirit to them. He was transmitting spiritual stuff. You know, like in, in Christian circles, we use words like grace. You know, you take communion or you do something and you, you receive the grace of God or something like that. It's the same idea in Gnosticism, but there was this idea of when you kissed someone, you were, especially when it was Jesus, you were saying this person is spiritually advanced. And so he's kissing Mary, and apparently more than once, wherever it was, mouth, you know, cheek, whatever. And the disciples are like, hey, what gives? I mean, we're the 12. Why are you kissing her more often than us? We're the ones that travel with. I mean, you're, we're the ones that you called. I mean, we're the disciples. Did you forget about us? So they're offended because Jesus is essentially saying Mary's just more advanced spiritually than you guys are. To a Gnostic. I mean, that, that, that's how the Gnostics look at that. So again, that's either... 
and again, you, you can read the Gnostic Gospels and, and you know, look up references to kissing and, and whatnot, and you, you'll see those passages. So you either have to believe that that's what's going on or that nobody in the Gnostic circles knew where babies came from, which is really dumb. I don't think any of us are going to say that, yes. Since you already covered how much later the Gnostic Gospels came or were written in the New Testament, do you even consider that account um, feasible that he did kiss her or that he did whatever? I would, I, I would, I would say I, I think it's feasible in that Paul you know, uses the same terminology, greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, and, and when we're going to get to Romans 16, which is a really important passage about the role of women, the elevation of women in the early church. Uh, and you have the same language there, so it, it, it could apply to male or female. And if, if Paul's doing it, and it's an accepted Jewish custom, I don't see why, why Jesus would have shuddered at the thought. I, I think it just would have been the thing to do. You know, it's just a normal cultural thing. It, it, it might have meant something more coming from Jesus because it's Jesus. Jesus approves of me, makes me feel good or something. Um, recognizes me as one of his disciples, you know, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. So I don't, I don't see any reason why Jesus would not have done that. Another question? Okay, oh, yes. Um, some researchers would equate um, the word companion with consort. I think there's some studies of that. Do you see any connection at all between uh, defining that word companion, that's quite a stretch to well, jump to constant. Yeah, the reason it's done is, is usually based upon English usage, which right there, there's a, there's a methodological flaw there. But, okay, my, my wife was here, and, and she's left, but if she was here, I mean, we could, I, you know, I guess I feel better that she's not here. <laughs> but, I mean, my wife is my companion. That's, that's sort of a, of a base-level designation. Uh, it, it, it has semantic variability, what we'd call valency in linguistics. Okay, she's my companion. Is she also my consort? Okay, in, in sexual terms, well, yeah, because she's my wife. But I can use the base level word companion of other people, and there is no necessary linkage in meaning. You know, it, it's just simple vocabulary. You know, we use words. In, in varied ways. And what you have to ask yourself as a reader is when I read this in the Da Vinci Code or whatever the source is, is there a necessary cause and effect relationship? This meaning causes that one. Just ask yourself simple logic questions. You know, how do, how do I frame the issue so that it, it becomes coherent? And I think, you know, if we do that, we start seeing things like I call lots of people companions, but they're not necessarily my consort. They might be in a given context. And if it's in Jesus, I would say the same thing with Jesus and Mary. Okay, Mary was the companion of Jesus. We could say, well, then she might have been involved sexually with him. Yes, she might have. Are there texts that say that? The answer is no. So if you're going to say something either publicly or in writing, and you care about the, the primary texts that tell us about these people, then I would think the responsible thing to do is go look at them and say what they say and don't say what they don't say. But you know, again, I, I'm not blaming Brown for this because it's a good storyline. That's where it started with Dan Brown. I have no doubt that this, is, this would make a cool novel. You know, good storyline, good plot line. The people that I you object to more are his sources who are purveying this stuff as though it is just unassailable truth and we are the real researchers in these texts and this information has been hidden from the public bunk okay if anybody's hiding anything you are either by default because you're not looking it up or if you did look it up and saw it and it didn't fit with your theory you're not telling people okay i don't know which it is i don't i don't worry about questions like that I'm just saying, if you're going to say something about figure A, figure B, and you're going to use this text or that text, read the thing and be honest. That's all I care about. That's what drives me when I do stuff like this. Next, any other questions? We can take a little break. Okay, let's take a few minutes. <laughs> 